afternoon. Good afternoon, ladies and gents. Uh, thanks for, for attending this afternoon. Um, James and the Flood Forum have asked me to come up again. I've spoken, I may have spoken to some of you previously um, at previous Flood Forum events that I've done. Uh, obviously, I'm representing Nottinghamshire Fire and Rescue Service, and I'm here this afternoon just to give you a bit of an awareness around the dangers that we get with uh, flood water, whether that's standing or moving flood water when we get heavy downfalls of rain and that sort of thing. I understand that some of you may be um, flood wardens already, road closure wardens, those sorts of things. Some of you may be coming to do that sort of role. And it's just to give you an idea, not only when you're in that role and, and carrying out that, that task, but also for those of you, as I'm sure most of you are parents, um, and some of the, these dangers, it's, it's information that you need to pass on to not only your own families, but other families, other siblings, etc. Um, I have to say right at the beginning that there are some images that within this that some people might find a little bit disturbing. Um, I'm not here to scare people, I'm not here to upset anybody, but I need to make the point that flood water can be very, very dangerous. It can be fatal, okay? So we, we do need to give it the appropriate amount of respect that it demands. Okay, let's have a look at a few facts and figures. Okay, uh, facts and figures from Rosper. Um, these figures are probably three years old now. Uh, this hasn't been updated for a while, but year on year, we're looking around sort of six, 700 drownings a year. Now that's not all to do with, with flood water and stuff, but uh, we'll break that down a little bit further. 403 of those are inland drowning incidents. So that's in water, so it's not rivers, not coastal, yeah, but inland drowning. So static water, ponds, reservoirs, quarries, these sorts of things where admittedly children pro probably go most of the time um, in the warmer weather, um, but it just proves that this is a major problem when we're looking at in inland waterways. 352 <coughs> rivers, streams, etc. So again, a stream, something like the pot will die, um, although there's only at this time of year six to eight inches of water in it, if we've got the wrong people in that environment, then yes, that can be fatal. Fall into there, face down, a young child, we've got a fatality on our hands straight away. The age group, that, as it says there, that are predominantly at risk of this are males 15 <coughs> to 35. Why do we think that's the case? Irresponsibility, yeah, to be fair. Bravado. It's, it's the old machismo that comes in, oh, I'll be all right, I can do this, I can do that. Um, and in fact, all inland waterways are classed as cold water. The average temperature of an inland waterway is somewhere between 10 and 15 degrees. So on a nice warm day like today, and you think, oh, it's really warm, jump in there, it's very cold, and automatically we're suffering with cold water shock. So that's why it affects this sort of group, because it, all of a sudden, nice and warm, it's a nice and cold, can't survive. Okay, and they can, you can get into difficulties within two or three minutes when suffering from cold water shock. So, let's have a look at the drowning problem. Um, there's little chance for those who get into difficulties in water, especially water which is deep, fast flowing, or cold, or all of those three. Got a little bit of a video coming in, in a couple of slides time, just to show how fast flowing flood water can be. And flood water that's moving um, at six inches deep on a tarmac or a concrete surface, so a road, um, could quite easily wash you off your feet, even if it's only six to eight inches deep, and it's quite surprising. You may think, well, I've got the wellies on, I can wade through that, but all of a sudden, no traction and you're away. And once you've fallen over, it will just wash you away. It's relentless. The flow of water doesn't stop. No one can turn the tap off, yeah? So you'll just keep going. So that's why um, people get into difficulties very, very easily. Drowning, obviously, um, is the final and deadly condition. And drowning is, is surprisingly easy to occur. Um, a, a big misconception with drowning is people think to drown, I've got to go under the water, I've got to be held under water and not be able to breathe. And that's not the case. Just breathing in a small quantity of water can cause you to drown because it affects the respiratory process within your lungs and unfortunately you suffocate because you've got water or fluid in your lungs. So it's not a case of having to be submerged for any period of time. And that death, if for those that may not be aware, can happen 72 hours after you've inhaled the water. It's a term that's called secondary drowning. So you may well fall in, breathe some in, stand up, go home, lay down in bed and drown. And you're actually at home in bed, nice and cosy. 
And so again, it's an important thing to be aware when we're working around water. Okay, those who cannot swim will drown in seconds. That probably is probably something that is pretty, pretty obvious to you. If you can't swim, you've got no chance. Um, are we all confident swimmers that we've got in the room? Everyone happy that if we went and jumped in the leisure centre we could swim a few lengths? Probably not. But for moving water, it's even harder. Even harder to get a balance, harder to stay above the water without breathing anything in. Those that do drown um, may not be seen again until recovered many days later. And this is a problem. Um, certainly in rural areas where we've got lots of what we call strainers and things like that, if someone does get washed away in a large flow of water, they could be held underneath the water for many days. And then we're looking at, if we've got the police dive team, I know it's not the dive team that are with it, but the dive truck outside, they're the people that ultimately turn up to go and find whoever it is that we've lost. So it can be pretty, uh, pretty serious stuff. So, this drowning chain, how do we get into it? Well, clearly, um, ignorance, disregard, or misjudgment of the danger. And this is where, as we spoke about with these males, 15 to 35, not aware of what's going on, yeah? Think they can do more than they actually can do. If the Flood Forum are sending some of you guys out to do road closures, to be flood wardens, to pass the message around about where the flood waters and things are, does that make you aware of all the hazards? Because you've been told you can go out into these waters. I would argue not, okay? You could quite easily misjudge something, a flow of water that's coming down the area that you need to be working in. Do you know where all the hazards are in your area? We're going to look at some of those uh, potential hazards that you might have. You need to know where they are in specific areas that you're going to work, so you know not to go near them. The lay of the land looks totally different when it's submerged underwater. And misjudging distances. I'm sure there's a culvert here somewhere. I'm sure it's three or four metres that way, one step, and you're in it, because you can't read the land. Very easy to do. Unrestricted access, you're obviously going to have that if you're going to be a flood warden. You're, you're sort of allowed to go out and wander around. That's not really the idea. The idea is to keep you safe. Yeah? So, yes, you've got unrestricted access, but so have family members, kids that want to go out. Oh, come on, Mum, let me go out and I can go paddling in the, in the puddles outside. What if, uh, if someone's put paddling in the road where it's six inches deep of water, but the manhole cover's lifted? All of a sudden, it's not six inches, it's a 12 foot drop into a main sewer. It's gone. Okay, so these hazards are there, even though the water may look very innocuous, may not be fast flowing, but the, the dangers can still be there. Okay, absence of adequate supervision, that sort of rolls on nicely from what I've just spoken about with regards um, looking after family members. Um, I've seen images uh, through my career of um, people out wading waist deep in flood water, might have a, some sort of a pole to try and find stuff, but are they being supervised? Are they being supervised correctly? Should anybody be in flood water? No, not really. Unfortunately, if your house is affected, then the best thing you can do is stay indoors, get yourself to a place of safety inside, and we'll come and get you. That's what we're there for. You've probably seen, I hope you've seen some of the equipment we've got outside, boats, pathways, all the water rescue kit that we bring along, that's what we're there for. We're there to, to collect you and your family and, and, and relatives and things and take them to a place of safety. So you shouldn't be out paddling around in it. Okay, and an inability to save yourself or be rescued, like I've already said. I'm gonna look at a, a clip now, but if you get washed away, you may not be, we may not be able to rescue in some situations, depending on how fast flowing that water is, but the, the chances are, if you've not got the PPE that we've got, you won't be able to save yourself at all. Right, hopefully this video clip will play. There is no sound. Now this video clip, before I play it, it's quite dated, and it does come from the US. Um, and this, the flood water that we're in, um, for those that may or may not be aware, the US have quite a few flood channels in bigger cities that are bone dry most of the time, good downfall of rain, and the flood channels fill up. And we've got here is a young girl, she's around about 15 or 16, that is has been caught by members of the public and the police department by line, but she's stuck in the middle of a flood channel, okay? And it's sort of a bit of the ongoing rescue um, that is unsuccessful, um, I have to say. So let's talk through it, okay? So we can see straight away that we've got, um, that's a police officer that's gone in to try and help um, rescue, and he's been pulled in, and his colleagues are trying to rescue him. Now we can see there's a line, 
he's got one arm snagged around, but we can see how fast that flow is. How deep do you think that water is? Any ideas? It's about a foot deep, yeah. Just, you know, in a few minutes, the, the, the young girl, unfortunately, does try to stand up in it. Um, but you can see how fast it's flowing. When he finally gets pulled out, you'll see how much debris is wrapped around him. And that's the casualty out on the far side there, that's caught with the line under her arms, trying desperately to hang on. No chance of standing up, none whatsoever. Now, I've no idea how she ended up in that situation. But as we rest, you look at all the debris that's caught around him, stuff that we can't see. So, of course, that's adding to the weight. He's struggling to hold on. He's a, a, you know, a very fit, well-trained policeman. Unfortunately, she's stuck there. And this, like I mentioned right at the beginning, it's relentless, it's powerful, it's never going to give up. That's a sofa. Okay? And there she goes, she, she tries to stand up. Not a chance. The picture's not the best in the world. But unfortunately, as the video pans out, we can see where the flood channel's going. And that was it. Washed away and gone. Okay? And it was, she was recovered later on when the, when the flood water had, had um, subsided. Now, yeah, it's quite a large event, admittedly quite a large event. Something we don't have a hazard like that in our local area. Not quite as large as that. But we'll look at some as I move on a little bit further that we certainly have got. So, sometimes it rains too much, and I don't know how many of you in the room were affected by the large scale flooding that we had three years ago now. Um, possibly quite a few of you were quite seriously affected by that. Um, and you've probably heard this before, we can't go on about it because sometimes it rains too much, and it does, to be fair. One inch of rainfall over one square mile gives us 14 and a half million gallons of water. So where's that all gonna go? Sometimes we may have, unless we've got a lot, very large scale flood defences or flood channels like that, building, just sort of trying to keep up with that flow of water, it's impossible. It floods off the field, fields and, and, and the surrounding areas. For those that work metric, I know I'm in old school in inches and, and, and gallons and things, one centimetre over one square kilometre is 10 million litres. It doesn't really make any difference. It's a large quantity of water and we've got to find somewhere for it to go. Very difficult. So let's look at some of the implications that come from you being out there, whether you're in your flood warden or road closure warden uh, role, or whether you're just out there trying to save your own properties and premises and things. There's lots of hazards that are out within that water that's swilling around. Let's look at hazardous materials first. We've got chemicals. What sorts of chemicals might you think could be out there? Fuel. Yeah, fuel's a good one. Um, <coughs> we've all got garages with petrol cans for the mower and the strimmer and so on and so forth. So yeah, we could quite easily have fuels. With, um, some of us may have heating oil tanks for that sort of thing. If they get washed out, then we end up with heavy oils, fuel oils, petrols, diesels, those sorts of things. Um, industrial chemicals. We've certainly got industrial premises around in the town. If they start to get affected through large scale flooding, then some of those industrial chemicals could be washed out into our gardens, into our surrounding areas. Um, household chemicals, again, everything gets washed out from underneath the kitchen sink, out of your garages, your outbuildings, your sheds. So we're looking at all those sorts of things. And again, if you're paddling around in it, then that's contaminating your clothing. We've got dry suits that we use, but of course, if they become contaminated, then we've got issues around how we can then redeploy our crews, even in our kit, because our kit's not impervious to all this sort of stuff. So we have to be very careful what we do. Let's look at biological things. Okay, it sounds a bit more sinister than it perhaps is. Sewage, that's predominantly going to be one of the big things. All the storm drains end up filling with water. We get large quantities of sewage, raw effluent, all that sort of thing. You don't want to be paddling around in that. There are all sorts of, as I'm sure you can imagine, all sorts of nasties that are lurking around in there. Agricultural effluent, yes, we're in a rural area, so we're going to get large quantities of that washing down off the fields and those sorts of things. Uh, waterborne pathogens. Um, does anybody in the room know anything about waterborne pathogens? Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Has anyone heard of something called leptospirosis? Wheels disease. Wheels disease, yeah. Wheels disease is the, is the sort of the follow-on from leptospirosis, yeah. Um, that's a fatal disease. If it's untreated, that can kill you. Admittedly rare, but you can die from it. 
Um, that comes predominantly from contact with animal urine, in fact, from cattle and rats. So if we think that all the fields are washed off, all into our streets and stuff, we're paddling around in it, and then we nip in to have a sandwich or perhaps have a cup of tea, something like that. We haven't washed our hands, and all of a sudden we could come down with leptospirosis. Hepatitis B, that's out there as well. Um, cyanobacteria, that's out there as well. Lots and lots of really ser serious stuff that can cause us long-term problems, if not be fatal to us. And then there are the issues, um, if it's large-scale, long-term flooding, like was, like was experienced on the Somerset levels a couple of years ago, dead, decayed animals, vegetation, all rotting down, all washed again into our front gardens, into our high streets. So that's why we need to be aware to not get in it. Keep out of it, try and keep ourselves away from the danger. Right. Those of you that have seen this before, this, this bit hasn't changed, but it's knowing your area, knowing what the hazards are. So what can you see in that picture? Does anyone spot anything? <coughs> A whirlpool, yeah, around about there. Yeah. Quite a little, quite a little innocuous whirlpool, yeah. Let's sort of have a look at the bigger, a bit closer. There we go. It's all very big, probably foot across. So yeah, we've got that little bit of a adventure effect going on. So obviously something siphoning there. It's got a bit like a plug hole, isn't it? Something's going down. Let's have a look at the same area. There's no water. So this could be one of your streets, one of the junctions where we live, and. Oh, where, where on earth could that be? Bearing in mind there's a sign, so it was happening somewhere around here. Can we see anything? No, not in that picture we can't. If we turn around, look at it from the other way, that's a culvert, 24 inch culvert going underneath the road. So all that water is being siphoned down and through those two culvert pipes. So going back to what I said earlier on about knowing your area and being able to misjudge things, you might be walking down the road thinking, well, I know there's a culvert here somewhere. That whirlpool wasn't there. That whirlpool was over here because it's drawing the water down and across. So all of a sudden I can see that that must be where the culvert is. Splosh, and we're straight down and straight in there. And that's it. That's the end. There is no coming back from falling in there because that relentless draw, that siphon effect, will pull you straight into there. Right. Another case, another case story. This one is very tragic, to be honest. Uh, it is set in America, admittedly, but this was a residential house, as we can see. A young family, mum and dad, two kids, um, and the youngest son, uh, I think he was 13, if I remember right. A big, large-scale uh, rainstorm, lots of localised flooding, um, and the whole front garden was flooded. Not just a deep, but it was flooded, you know, six, eight inches, something like that. Um, and the youngest son asked mum, is it okay if I go out and have a bit of a splash around in the garden? Yeah, of course you can, no problem. Remember we talked about adequate supervision? Yeah, of course you can, off you go. So off he went, splashing around, great, you know, mum's got an item out the window, great, brilliant. For about an hour, no sign of him, mum's thinking, hmm, where's he gone? That's a bit unusual, the way he could have disappeared, has he gone off to his friends? Didn't, you know, he didn't come in and say he was going out anyway. The bottom of the garden was a little culvert, a little drain. So they suddenly, once the waters have subsided and we're starting to look for him now, can't find him, where on earth could he be? And obviously panic sets in then. We're thinking there's this, this small drain, small stream, brook type culvert thing at the bottom of the garden. So let's start looking, let's start having a dig. So they dig that steel pipe out, and they have these sort of pipes in the States, and that's a 14 inch pipe. So what's that? That sort of size and diameter, tiny, tiny, tiny pipe. But unfortunately, that's where they found him. They found him inside that pipe. Now, I'm only going to show you that image. I'm not going to show you the other one. But he's bent double. He's literally been folded in half, as you can see, and wedged in there through the force of water. And that was from going out to play in his own front garden. And not being adequately supervised because Mum, and himself, to be fair, didn't understand the dangers of being out playing in puddles in the front garden. So we have to take this sort of thing seriously. Large scale flooding is really, really serious. And going out on canoes, um, in your wellies, in your waders, all that sort of thing, it's just not on. You need to keep away from those sorts of areas. So let's look at this. That's just a highway, large scale flooding, water moving across the road surface. These are the sort of areas you'd possibly be working in. Uh, large scale flow there. You could be swept off your feet 
and down into a drainage ditch on site. Very easily done, like I've said. So you need to put your road closures in place wherever you need to do. Don't walk through it. Keep well away from it. Again, something similar there. Um, the flow of water on the road is not too bad. Traffic can travel through it. Um, but believe it or not, six inches of water could move, could wash one of those cars. If it's coming sideways on, could wash one of those cars off the road. Okay. Think about a car or a vehicle. How heavy is the average car? A ton, something like that. But what has it got that keeps it to the road? Four bags of air that help it float. So although cars might be relatively heavy, once they're submerged in water, they become very light, they become very unstable, and they move sideways very, very easily. And again, we can see another inrush into a culvert there. Yeah. So have we got any areas like this in Southall? Potwood Dyke travels under Church Street, so there's certainly a railing type affair there. Uh, I'm trying to think what others have we, uh, that we've got. Um, Nottingham Road, yeah, Nottingham Road is a classic one, yeah, that was really deep in the last flooding, wasn't it? Um, you could quite easily get swept under there, long gone. So these, wherever the areas you're going to work in, these are the things that hazards you need to be aware of and make friends and relatives aware. What I would suggest, the best way to enjoy it <laughs> is just like that. <laughs> Out to the edge of it, fishing rod there, cup of tea, pipe on, where you go. And that is me, um, I'm afraid.